Hello everyone, um, I'm Daniel and I'm here in Ghana, West Africa and Cody has asked me to prepare some teaching on knowing the Word of God and studying to show herself approved from William MacDonald's Discipleship Manual. So I count it a privilege to do so and I hope that uh, the next little bit here you'll hear things that will be of benefit to you and a blessing. Um, I've known William MacDonald for a number of years. I met him way back in 1993 at a conference where I heard him speak. I was very impressed and moved by the Holy Spirit to uh, respond to his preaching in a very uh, dedicated, consecrated way to Christ. And from that, I was led to go to California where I entered into a discipleship program and I was personally discipled by Mr. MacDonald who is a, a wonderful mentor, but more than anything, a great example of how to live the Christian life. As you read through his book, uh, Disciples Manual, you can be assured that the man did his very best, I believe, to live a, the true disciple of Christ. And so you can take his words to heart and learn from him, and I know you'll be greatly benefited by doing so. Um, I want to begin by referring to an Old Testament scripture, Ezra, Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, which reads this way, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. Ezra wrote uh, Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, the book of Ezra, and probably Nehemiah, so he's quite a significant writer in our Old Testament scriptures. He was a scribe, a scholar, and um, notice what it says, he prepared his heart. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. There's a <clears throat> important distinction in these three things and an important order there as well. Um, it's important that we gain knowledge of the word, but not just knowledge for the sake of knowledge. We're not satisfying our curiosity. We're not trying to equip ourselves for a job. We are not seeking to win an argument through gaining knowledge. We are seeking the Lord himself, and we're seeking to have a relationship to him. He is Lord, Master of all, Creator, Redeemer, and we are his subjects and his servants, and we need to recognize his authority over our lives, and so learn his word in order to obey him, to follow his word. And that's what Ezra understood, and so that's what Ezra sought to do. He set his heart on a course in life to learn the Word of God in order to do it. Some people set a course to learn the Word of God, but their motives are different and not according to God's perfect plan. And that's only going to lead us down a wrong path. If we're going to study the Word of God and learn it, we need to have the right heart. And that is a heart to know God, to love Him, to worship Him, and to honor Him by our obedience. Ezra not only uh, learned the Word of God to obey it, but also so that he could share it and teach it with others. Ultimately, God wants us to learn something so that we can be effectual in its communication to others. God's salvation is freely available to all, and he desires that his Word would be known, and so we can be the agents uh, to share that Word, and he's pleased to do that in us, for us, through us, if we are willing to apply ourselves. I've studied the Word of God for 30 years or more now, and I know that when I first got saved, I had an insatiable thirst for the Word of God. I wanted to know this God who came into my life and saved me. I had a great desire to consume the Bible. And that just seemed to be a natural reaction of being born by the Spirit of God, to have this thirst and hunger for God's Word. And uh, that, I don't think, has um, diminished at times. Perhaps it has not been as strong as others, but I've always had a keen interest to learn the Word of God. I wish I could instill into you that kind of thirst, that kind of desire to learn the Word, but only the Holy Spirit can really give you the true hunger and thirst that one needs to apprehend God's Word, to know it, and to uh, 
be useful in God's kingdom through being equipped with his word. So I, I leave that with you. I, I hope the few thoughts that I share with you in this video will be of help and service, but as for motivation, I leave that to the work of the Holy Spirit and trust as you prepare your own heart, the Holy Spirit will guide you, lead you, and direct you to show your love for God by dedicating yourself to his word. You know, Ezra lived at a time when there was a lot of um, restoration and Ezra was instrumental in bringing about spiritual revival for Israel at that time. They had gone into captivity, they had ran after idols, and now uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit and God moving the heart of uh, some kings and some different individuals, there's a revival that starts. And Ezra was instrumental in that. And I only mention that because we, we too need revival, we need restoration, we need to see a work of God done in our days. But let's be realistic about that. We can pray about it, but probably our best course of action is to invest like Ezra did. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it. And if we had the same kind of heart and we just invested heavily into the Word of God to learn, to know our God, to walk with our God, to obey His words, and to manifest to the world what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I believe that revival starts with a small flame, a small flicker of light, and then it works itself into a roaring fire because other people catch the flame and they move with it. You know, we can't just wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon us in some powerful way, and I suppose he can and will do that at times, but really our part is to invest ourselves as best we can into the Word of God and then watch what God does with that. Whether he begins a small revival in our own lives or through us revival in others, I believe the key is just to show God that we are serious and dedicated to him through our own attention to his Word. So we can learn that from Ezra. And uh, do note that in order to be qualified to teach the Word of God, it's important to notice that Ezra prepared his heart to seek, uh, to know the word, but also to do the word, and then once he was obedient to the word, he was then qualified to teach the word. Uh, we might fall into the trap of thinking because we have some knowledge we can share it. And that may work in other spheres, but in the spiritual realm, it's important that we manifest our obedience, that we've had experience with the word of God by our actions, and therefore, it qualifies us to communicate and share that effectively for others. Otherwise, they'll look at us and say, well, that's interesting, but I don't see it in you, so why should I do it? So, let's make sure that as we pursue the Word of God, that our aim is to be obedient to it ourselves. And then once we've got a pattern and experience of obedience and following the Lord, then we have something which we can share with power and authority, and people will take notice. Now, William MacDonald, in his book, The Disciples Manual, covers this section called Knowing the Word, and then another section called um, Study to Show Yourself Approved. And in the first, I think it's chapter 26, he talks about the Word of God, and he gives us four aspects of the nature of the Word of God. And these are really important points for us to study and think about because it affects our convictions and our understanding of God's Word and how we dedicate ourselves to it or how we learn it or teach it to others. So it's really important that we get these basic principles down. Also, then he's going to talk about our response to the Word of God, how we're supposed to respond to that Word. And there are a variety of ways he suggests for us to respond. But first of all, let's look at the nature of God's Word. First of all, he's going to teach us that God's Word is eternal. It lasts forever. There are very few things that we come in contact with that are eternal. Our soul is eternal, and right now we have bodies that are mortal, but we one day will be given an immortal body that will last forever. But we don't have that yet. But what we do have is the Word of God and the Spirit of God who lives in us. Both of those things are eternal. Thy word is forever settled in heaven, the scripture says. 
the word of God will last forever. It's God's word, it comes from him, and therefore it is eternal. Now, for that very reason, we should value it. It should be important to us because anything that lasts forever is important and it should be that which we center our attention and interest in. What happens in life is that we look at things in our immediate presence and they take our interest. For instance, all of us carry around a phone, some have a fancy iPhone, and we put a lot of attention and time into that shiny little thing. We push buttons on it all day and play games and do all kinds of interesting things. But uh, the Word of God, we don't always take a keen interest like that. It doesn't appeal to us because it's not something that we feel the immediate benefit necessarily of. Uh, it's a little harder for us to invest into the Word of God, but I just want you to grasp the idea of the value of the Word of God. It is eternal. It will last forever. And so if you invest into it and learn it, you've got something to carry into eternity and that which will help you in the eternal ages to come. And I believe our reward in heaven will be proportionate to the investment we make now into learning his word because that's directly proportional to our relationship to our Lord Jesus, how much we know of him and how well we manifest him to others. So learning... Um, to value the Word of God. We love the little temporary pleasures we have in this world, and we all have our little comforts, our visit to Tim Hortons or Starbucks or running to the gym or whatever it is that we do in our daily experience, things that we like, that we enjoy, that we spend our time and energy doing. But if we could just get a glimpse of the value of the, the, the enormity of what the Word of God is, God's eternal word. You know, one day our bodies will lay dead in the grave and long after we're gone, people forget our names and our gravestones will weather away and we'll be forgotten. But the word of God endures forever. It doesn't change. It's been around for thousands of years since it was penned and recorded and it survives every generation. And if we invest into it, it becomes part of us and that eternal word of God can live in us and through us and will bless us in eternity. So um, I really think we should think of the Word of God as so valuable. I know I have this group of kids that come to the house every day uh, from the neighborhood and they just come to hang out and play games and have fun. Our house is kind of a nice hangout for them. And uh, we enjoy having them. And I thought to myself, well, since the kids are coming, I'm going to take some time to read with them. So we've been reading through Mark's Gospel over several weeks and I don't know who's coming when they come but when I see a group of kids I go outside with a bunch of Bibles and I say okay kids we're going to read and, and it's a simple thing but it really um, encourages my heart that these children are getting the Word of God they're, they're getting some reading skills they're learning a little bit maybe they don't fully comprehend what they're reading in fact I know they don't fully comprehend but they're getting little bits little smatterings of God's Word and that is the fuel for the Holy Spirit to awaken them to their spiritual need to bring about eternal life. And someday in eternity, long from now, maybe I'll see some of those young faces again because they spent some time learning God's Word and the Holy Spirit was able to use that to bring them to faith in Christ. So we have to value the Word of God. It's eternal. The other thing that Mr. McDonald will teach us about the Word of God is that it's verbally inspired. That means that every word within our Bible is inspired of God. Now I say that with some qualification. We need to understand that we read an English Bible and the English Bible is a translation from the original. When we say verbal inspiration, we refer to the original writings of the authors of the Bible, Moses and Paul and David and others, they wrote under direct inspiration. The Holy Spirit moved them to write the very words of God. So, and we have accurately transmitted to us in our own language those words. If we really want to get as close as we can to the original, it requires we have to do a little study, a little digging to understand something about those original languages so that we can uncover the meaning 
of those original words, but we do have a very reliable and accurate um, translation into English and many, many translations we can compare notes with so that we can um, get as close as we can to God's authentic, true, written word. Why is that important? Well, it's very important because there are people that will undermine the word of God and question its authority and uh, we get into all kinds of um, false doctrine and uh, false practices because people attack the Bible or don't take it as literally as it should be taken. The Bible in some places is difficult to understand, but a lot of places are plain and straightforward and people can argue all they want, make excuses all they want, but there are the words of God preserved for us to learn. They're not the opinions of men, they're not the um, you know, gatherings of a few scholars to try and put something together. It is the very Word of God that has been delivered down through the ages and we have it with us today. Inspiration, he'll point out, is different than illumination. Inspiration is God revealing things um, and giving them to men and they write down the very thoughts, the very words of God. Uh, but also, the Holy Spirit does a work in us to teach us the meaning of God's Word. That's called illumination. He's like a light shining to illuminate and give us understanding of the text. So, um, just as light enters a room and reveals what's in the room, so the Holy Spirit uh, shines upon the page of Scripture to help us understand what it's all about. There are lots of intelligent people that can read the Bible and understand words and their meaning and yet miss out on spiritual truth because the Holy Spirit is not the one uh, guiding them and directing them. That's illumination. And that could be illustrated, for instance, when the Lord Jesus is speaking to Peter in Matthew 16 and he says to Peter, um, well, after he asked the question, who do the people say that I am, or who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus' replied to him was, um, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven, which meant that his understanding of the identity of Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, was in fact a work of a spiritual work. He said the Father in heaven has revealed it to him and that would be through the work of the Holy Spirit identifying a spiritual reality of who Christ is. Many people didn't recognize that truth. They saw the man, they didn't recognize who he really was, but Peter did and that was given to him from heaven. So this is spiritual revelation or illumination and it's um, what we all depend on. So we're completely dependent on the Holy Spirit in order to understand the words of God. Next, he's going to talk to us about the sufficiency of the Word of God, and he uses a couple references, one from 2 Peter 1, verse 3, and another one from 2 Timothy 3, 17. In 2 Peter, he says that uh, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. So the Word of God reveals the knowledge of Christ, and through that we have everything that we need for life and godliness. We don't need to go beyond the page of Scripture in order to live the life that God intends and fulfill everything that He wants us to do. There's a lot of Christians that have a lot of fanciful ideas about signs and miracles and wanting more revelations from God. Well, Peter's quite plain that we have everything we need and the Scriptures um, are said to be once delivered to the saints. The faith which was once delivered to the saints, says Jude. So we can rely on the Word of God as being complete. It is everything that we need to guide us. Now, it doesn't deal with every specific detail in our lives. There might be something like somebody says, well, what about smoking cigarettes? Does the Bible allow that? Well, the Bible doesn't address smoking cigarettes, but it's not that it doesn't attend to that particular issue in a broad sense, because certainly we know that these bodies of ours are the temple of the Holy Spirit and we're not to destroy the temple. And we know that smoking is a destructive um, 
influence on our body, so it would be unwise. It's not a command of scripture, but it would be unwise. It would be good counsel to say, no, don't do that. It's not healthy for your body. So we learn principles from the word of God, which can govern and guide us in any and all situations in life. So we have everything. The word of God is sufficient. Also in Timothy, he'll tell us that the word of God is um, sufficient uh, to thoroughly equip the man of God for every good work. So as we seek to do something for God, to live for him, to serve him, to uh, make him known, God can equip us and he can give us everything we need through the word of God. And sometimes we might excuse ourselves and say, well, I'm not qualified, I can't do that. In fact, God has provided everything we need. We just need to invest in what he's already given to us. The word of God is a training manual for all of our service, for everything that we do for God. And if we look at each book of the Bible, I think we can discern uh, that God has a purpose in each book to teach us something or many things, but maybe predominantly one thing. Maybe the book of Nehemiah teaches us about leadership, or Matthew teaches us about discipleship, or uh, John teaches us about the divinity of Christ. Whatever it might be, if we see the purpose of that book and we read it accordingly, then we will be equipped with that tool in our tool chest to help us live this Christian life and be effective in God's kingdom. So the sufficiency of the Word of God. The Word of God is sufficient, and if we understand that, then we'll invest thoroughly into it. We won't miss out any tools. In my little tool room, I have lots of tools, and I, I really uh, annoyed if I'm going to do a job and I can't find the right tool for that job. But I'm glad that I have a variety of tools so that when I run into some kind of task I have to do, I can select the right tool. It's the same with the Word of God. It thoroughly furnishes us for every good work. So we need to make sure we have every tool and we um, can build on that tool by studying those books carefully and understanding how each one is to be applied and used in our experience. Now also, he uh, talks on the nature of the, of the Word of God when he talks about the infallibility of the Word of God. This means that God's where it has no error. There's no error in the Word of God. It, um, when it was written, because it was written uh, or given to us by inspiration of God, the original autographs or the writings of the authors of the Bible gave us that which is infallible. It cannot be uh, an error or fault in it. So there's no doctrines that disagree. You don't find Moses disagreeing with uh, Samuel or, or Abraham disagreeing with uh, Matthew or anything. It, it, there's a consistency in the Word of God. There's no error. Now people do attack the Bible and do try to find error in it because they're motivated to find it because they don't want to be accountable to the Lord. But in fact, if somebody's honest and sincere and they study the Word of God carefully, they will see that God is completely consistent and what he reveals to us doctrinally throughout the Old and New Testament periods. This is important for us to really grasp because if we, if we don't have confidence that the Word of God is without error, it's going to put us on shaky ground and we're going to wonder about our Christian faith. There will become a time when we wonder, is it all true if, if this could be? And, and one of the problems in the modern day in which we live is that People will claim that the earth is millions or even billions of years old, and if you study carefully the Bible, you would say, well, the Bible would seem to suggest the earth is about 6,000 years old, and there's this glaring inconsistency. And great minds, sometimes great Christian minds, have tried to compromise and to accommodate what the world or what science is telling us. What we need to do is, as Jesus said, if we abide in him, we will know the truth. And there is this need to uh, test and experience the Word of God in order to prove it to ourselves. So it's an experiential thing um, that validates it for us. Not our clever minds, because our minds are not clever enough to figure out God's revelation. But God reveals things and he says, if you abide in me, you will know the truth. And 
we find, find confidence. That's why simple believers who are not well educated can stand firmly on the Word of God because God's revealed it to them and they have that confidence by the Holy Spirit that what they have laid their foundation on is a solid rock and it's not moving, it's solid, it'll be there when all the science has changed its mind and changed its dates and, and everything. So I'm not going to debate about the science of the age of the earth, that's uh, another whole topic, but sufficient to say that the Word of God stands and we can rely on it. It is infallible and we do well to take it, uh, what it teaches, as reliable and when it seems to contradict what other men are saying we're better off to trust the Word of God and wait to see how that falls out. Um, I'm not saying we throw our brains away, we study, we think through issues carefully, but we know that God's Word is truth and the source of truth and men are, when they claim to know truth, <laughs> They are being quite arrogant because they can't can't make an eyeball. They can't. Um, it, men are so limited. God is so unlimited in His power and knowledge, and so we need to trust Him as He reveals things to us in the Word, and uh, not uh, worry when we run into some difficult problems. That God is big enough to solve those if we just. Take time. Now, let's move on to the second section, and that is our response. William McDonald's going to talk about how we are to respond to the Word of God. And the first thing he's going to tell us is that we need to read the Word of God. There's a blessing promised in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, a blessing to everyone who reads this book. Now, that would, of course, apply to the book of Revelation, but also we can apply it broadly to the, all of the Scriptures. God will bless us for reading His Word. And I think most Christians probably do read the Word of God, probably daily. Um, but there are potentially Christians who live their whole life and never read through the whole of Scripture, which is a real tragedy. This is God's gift to us. This is God's guidance to us. This is the most valuable, important thing that we can learn in our lives, in our short journey of life for a few years on this earth. The best and most noble pursuit is to learn what God has communicated to us. And so we need to invest 66 books. Well, we could read that in a year uh, with a very slow reading pace. If you're really slow like me, you might take three years and read one chapter a day. Um, or if you're a good reader and you enjoy reading, you might read 10 chapters a day and get through it in a few months. But we should read. We should read at whatever pace we can handle and learn the Word of God that way. You know, some, some Christians just don't take advantage of that great resource that's available to them in the Word of God. If somebody came along and put a million dollars in your bank account, and you just let it sit there and never used it, that would be quite a waste. You know, I think if somebody put a million dollars and it's free, you can use it, do what you want. I think most of us take advantage of that and say, yeah, I need a new car, I'd like to buy a new house and get some nice clothes. and. Uh, yeah, we would take advantage of that. And yet here is the Word of God, the greatest treasure of all. And some people don't take advantage of that. They don't invest in it. They don't see or understand or perceive the treasure that is there. And once we dig and, and look into the Word of God, I think we'll find that it's much more than a million dollars. It's got eternal riches that will never end if we take time to dig. And God will reward us for digging. Because he wants us to have those riches. He's not withholding like a miser from us anything. But he expects us to dig a little bit, pursue after him, and he'll gladly reward us. So we should read the Word of God. Reading is the first step. But after we read, we should learn to study. Study. To take the Word of God in and look at it carefully to understand its meaning. Um, you know... We often study things that we're interested in. Sometimes I take some interest in certain medical issues because they're relevant. Maybe I'm uh, struggling with something medically and I think, well, you know, I, I'm going to learn about that. For instance, if the doctor told you, um, you have stage 3 melanoma. Let's just say you went to the doctor's office and said, look, I, I, I've done some tests and you've got stage 3 melanoma. Well, suddenly I think 
you'd be really interested to know what that meant and what implication it had on your life. So you would probably read everything you could about it, take great interest in it. You'd study, you'd learn, because it's important. But we don't always think that way about the Word of God, and we should. We should. We should say, this is really important stuff. I really need to know this. This is going to help me now and through eternity, so I need to take some time. But oftentimes we, we treat the Word of God so casually, we, we don't think it's that important to us, or we leave it to somebody else. Maybe on Sunday we'll listen to the preacher tell us about the Word of God. But every Christian should pick up his Bible with a hunger and thirst and know what it says for them personally, because it is the most important thing that we can learn in our lives. So take some time to study the Word of God. Uh, I've tried in the past to encourage people to study the Word of God, and I must admit it's been a bit disappointing to not see people take more interest in dedicating themselves to a study of the Word of God. Now, I suppose this discipleship program is about that, and it's an attempt to get people to motivate to study more. Well, I can't, I can't promise that that will happen. You have to be dedicated. You have to be determined that this is what you're going to do. Like Ezra, he dedicated his heart. He set his heart on a course. And you need to be disciplined to do that. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And I think if you just really evaluate what your relationship to the Word of God is, how important is it to you? Is it as important as information about melanoma, if that's what the doctor told you you had? Is it, is it that important to your soul to understand that the eternal issues of not only do you have eternal life and how well are you doing in your Christian life, you're growing in Christ, what will your reward be and where will you be in eternity based on what investments you're making now? Jesus talked about storing up your treasure in heaven. And so are we storing up? Are we investing? Are we just biding our time until one day we're translated into heaven, thinking that's all that we need to do? Uh, there's a lot more we need to study. We need to take time individually to learn the Word of God so that we can uh, grow and be useful in God's kingdom. The other thing he wanted to tell us uh, to do is to memorize, to memorize God's Word. And this is investing, again, because of the importance of these truths, not only to think about them and consider um, the meaning of God's Word, but to just take time to instill it into our minds and hopefully into our hearts by memorizing it. Memorizing is hard work. It's not simple. It takes a lot of investment of time and energy to learn the Word of God. And some of you may know that we run a memory challenge here in Ghana every year. And uh, I'm always amazed at what some of these children can do. They invest for um, learning not only verses but chapters and books of the Bible. One boy this year, well, he's not a boy, he's a young man, he we was able to quote seven chapters in one hour to me and he learned it in basically a day. He's just absolutely brilliant at memorizing. Many Christians go through their whole life without memorizing uh, a chapter. They might be able to say Psalm 23 or the Lord's Prayer but they haven't invested into memorizing God's Word. And it's a great value. Think of those verses that are committed to your memory, like John 3, 16. We all know that one, or Romans 10 and 9, or maybe um, um, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, or Titus 3, 5, or uh, any, any verses that come to your mind that you think of. Those verses become really valuable. They're valuable tools to witness to people, or they become... Um, a great comfort and help to us in the difficulties and trials of life when we can just draw on that resource from within that we know God's Word. Now, um, that will directly impact how uh, effective we can be in our uh, sharing the Word of God with others because when they see that it's important enough for us to memorize it, then they'll know there's something really important there for us. You know, the Muslims, they 
They work at memorizing the whole Quran, and many of them do. They memorize the whole thing. And it's not as big as the Bible, but it's a remarkable achievement nonetheless. And as Christians, they put us to shame that we often don't invest in learning the Word of God as we should. So it's that fuel which the Holy Spirit uses in our life in so many different ways that we quote a verse at just the right time to comfort somebody who's going through something, or we use it as a spear of conviction to help somebody turn away from their sin and to follow the Lord, perhaps in witnessing. What a great tool in witnessing to be able to just quote verses that are pertinent to the, uh, the person. You know, so many people will trust in their good works and to be able to say, well, the scripture says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus chapter 3 verse 5. So if we're able to quote scripture, that will be a tremendous power available to us in our, in our life, in our ministry for the Lord. He also says we should meditate. Meditate means to think spend time considering, and this is a lost art. Many of us don't spend much time thinking. We live such busy lives, we're moving from here to there. We don't spend that quality time just considering, what does this mean? What is God saying here? When we read our Bible daily, don't, don't be in a rush. If you can't get through a whole chapter, you just read a couple verses, but you think about it. Let yourself consider the words and the meaning. And that's the time when the Holy Spirit will speak to you. That's the time when God's going to teach you something. It's when you take time to think and consider. And God says in one place, come let us reason together. Reason means to consider, to think, to evaluate. And so it's really important that we use our minds. The Lord Jesus told us that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Our mind. And so we need to meditate, and that is a great exercise to consider carefully. You know, we, we spend a lot of time playing around games and sports, recreation. We, 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 we use our mind in many different ways, and some of it's so frivolous and so empty, and it's not going to have any value in eternity. But what really matters in eternity is the Word of God and what we've gained from it. So as we meditate on it, we learn it, that will not only serve us uh, to live for Christ now, but it will be um, that which will help us in eternal ages to come. Um, so the psalmist says, blessed is the man that meditates in the Word of God day and night. We can start our day thinking about the Word of God, end our day. We can. If you're like me, some days you spend the whole day in the Word of God and learn different things. And what a joy and blessing that is, is to spend time with the Lord and His Word and, and think carefully through. These are the times when the most profound things we learn and gain and can use for a benefit of ourselves and others. Um, you know, some people can tell you all about the football match and everything that happened, but a month down the road, who cares? It doesn't matter anymore. The score, who scored what goal, doesn't matter anymore. But the Word of God doesn't change. It's forever. And what we learn of it is an eternal investment. Um, we're also to obey the Word of God, as we learn from Ezra, the importance of obeying. The Word of God makes us responsible. And we know that we have these deceitful hearts. <laughs> we sometimes want to excuse ourselves by our knowledge like oh I know all about that but we haven't acted on it we haven't done it and that's a great danger that we all fall into is to be aware of what God says to know what he expects and we can speak of it and we can tell others but we're not practicing it and James says that we should not be um, hearers only but doers of the word uh, obedience is essential in the Christian life and the way that we will advance in our knowledge and in our spiritual growth. And so we must um, be sure that we're learning in order to obey. Um, and then he talks about teaching and preaching the Word of God. 
teaching and preaching. So as Ezra would learn the word of God to obey it himself and then teach it to others. God wants his word to be shared. He wants his gospel to be shared. He tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. How well are we doing at that? How well are we? Sometimes maybe we don't feel qualified. And well, we're really not qualified, are we? But we hold in our hands something of such great value. We really ought to share it for just the sheer value of it, not because of anything in us, because we're good or we're righteous or we're holy. Or we've figured out things because we're smart. No, we're not. We're, we're just sinners saved by grace. And we can take that great treasure. What scripture says is that uh, treasure hidden in earthen vessels. And if we can get over our fears and over ourselves and just somehow communicate God's word to others. You know, as Christians, the word of God is tied to us. We are supposed to be living epistles. We're supposed to be representative of God's word, not only in our words, but in our actions as well. We're Christians. We're followers of Christ. We believe certain things. We practice certain things. And that should be manifest in our life in many different ways. So when I go to the grocery store and I buy my groceries, I may not say anything, but as I bump into people, I talk to people, I converse people, it should become evident within a short period of time that I'm a Christian, and I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Jesus, maybe by the language I use or the mannerisms in which I treat people, there should be some evidence. And some people, unfortunately, well, they call themselves Christian, but there isn't enough evidence to convict them of that. Nobody would suspect that they were a Christian because they don't see anything unique or different about their character. There's one fellow I just met recently, a Nigerian man, and I started conversing with him online, and it didn't take long before I recognized there was something different about him. Something I, I said, you know, the way this guy talks, the way he interacts, seems to me he's probably a Christian. So I kind of dropped the question on him. I said, so are you a follower of Jesus? And he said, well, sure, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my savior. And, you know, it became evident through his conversation. He betrayed the, the truth of who he was, a follower of Christ. And, you know, we are to communicate God's word. We're to teach it. Now, not everybody's going to be called to be a big preacher, teacher, or evangelist, or whatever, but every Christian can communicate. And they should communicate who they are and what they believe by their action and by their words. And people should recognize there's something about us that identifies us as followers of Jesus. And we seek to do that according to our ability, according to where we are in our maturity, and we just simply tell the truth, you know, I was saved, Jesus saved me, and this is the gospel, the way I understand it. We don't have to know the whole Bible, but we should be able to communicate what our understanding is. If we've been a Christian for 25 years and we don't know the Old Testament, we can't make differentiation between the Old and New Covenants, then there's something wrong. We, we need to show people that as Christians, we take our Christianity seriously and that we are seeking to be an agent of heaven to communicate his truth to others. So that's another thing that we need to do. And then lastly, he tells us that we should test all things by the word of God. The word of God is our standard. It is that which by, by which we live. So sometimes we, we throw around our opinions and our ideas and we, we, we use human wisdom and human uh, logic to try and solve all our problems. And yet we have this Bible, the, the Word of God, and if the better we know it, the better we equip ourselves, it is able to help us in all situations to judge a matter, to, to, to discern things that are spiritual or moral, and decide what the right course of action is. So it's our guide. Like the Bereans of Acts 17, they tested these things to see that they were so. And we can test everything by the Word of God. We can look at every circumstance in our life and say, is this what God wants from his word. Is this correct or is this wrong? And we can judge accordingly. Um, I'm going to stop there and then in the next video we'll talk about a study to be approved. I thought we'd get to it this time, but we've run out of time. So the next video we'll do that. I hope these little uh, uh, 
uh, thoughts here have been helpful and a blessing and uh, will maybe inspire you to make a greater investment in the Word of God. The Lord bless you as you all seek His will and to learn together. God bless you.